Lord, thank you that we could um, get together on this freezing cold morning and um, grow closer to you through um, understanding how to um, better defend the Christian faith um, and better give a reason uh, for the hope that lies in us. Um, I pray that you be glorified in our class. Help us to honor you with the way that we're thinking about this topic um, and honor you with the way that um, we're approaching it and, and then enacting it afterwards. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so last class, uh, one of the things I went through was uh, I gave some book recommendations. Um, and I realized I wanted to also, along with some book recommendations, give some um, recommendations on some people that are, I guess, well-known apologists who have all written lots of books or often do a lot of um, presentations um, or kind of have have their own like online apologetics courses um, so what some ones that I have enjoyed um, some people Robbie Zacharias is probably one of the most well-known apologists um, right now and he, he kind of has the perfect blend of really good content but does a lot of really good storytelling so that it's a little more interesting to listen to um, and then kind of on the flip side of that, another person that uh, is one of my favorites is a guy named William Lane Craig. So he's kind of more, um, not as interesting from the storytelling perspective, but he is probably the most like dry and just ultra precise in everything he says. So if you ever watch any online debates or anything like that, where he's, he's a common debater, debates a lot of um, prominent atheists, he's the guy that in those debates is just, just so perfect in the way he, he explains everything, and so a um, little less interesting to listen to, but um, if you want the ultimate precision, I like him. What's his name? Uh, William Lane Craig. Lane Craig. Lane Craig, yep. William Lane Craig. He has a, he has a ministry called Defenders, uh, or Reasonable Faith, I guess is maybe <clears throat> the name of the ministry, but, um, and then kind of somewhere in between, another guy named Frank Turek, um, kind of somewhat interesting to listen to, but also very precise in the way he, he goes about things. He's the one that, um, on the list of recommended books, uh, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. He's one of the co-authors of that book. Um, and then kind of the last guy that I really like um, is R.C. Sproul, um, who I think passed away just this past year or so. Um, he's got a lot of good stuff online. and he, If you're really into philosophy, um, if you're a huge philosophy buff, R.C. Sproul is, is an awesome resource where he just has lots and lots of classes on history of philosophy and um, how Christian thought corresponds with secular philosophy throughout time. And, um, yeah, so this week we're going to cover uh, the different approaches to apologetics and then kind of second half we're going to talk about worldview and, and implications of um, what our worldview is. Um, and so, with the different approaches to apologetics, um, it's, I'd say it's kind of somewhat similar to like your view on the end times, where there's a lot of different approaches and they all have a different fancy name. Um, and while it's good to understand the differences between them, um, I don't want to put too much emphasis on the, the nuances of their approaches, but um, you know, I want to put more emphasis on us doing the apologetics, but at the same time, uh, I want us to be able to, if you're, if you're listening to another teacher or anything, they might... Um, explain things such as um, their view on presuppositional apologetics, and I want us to be able to understand what the heck they're talking about when they mean that, um, and also help us to determine how we should go about um, approaching apologetics ourselves. Um, so there's four different approaches that we're going to talk about, and they mainly differ in, uh, one, what our starting point should be with apologetics. So... Uh, I remember last week I, I kind of wrote down the, the list of all the different classes we're going to go through, and it's kind of a flow of an argument, and each person that we're talking to is going to start at a different starting point. Some person might be the ultimate skeptic and not even know whether or not they exist. Another person might um, you know, have a grounding and they believe there is truth, but they don't know if God is true. Other person might believe God exists, but they just need to um, have the Christian truth faith explained to them, you know, there are different starting points. Um, so different approaches to apologetics differ on what our starting point should be in the first place, regardless of where the person's at. Um, I'll explain that a little more. 
And then the other one is um, they mainly differ on the level of confidence that they think we can or should have in our faith. Um, some might say that we should have, you know, near 100% confidence or can, and some might say, you know, we only need to prove the Christian faith that it's 51% possible rather than 49% possible. Um, so the first one is classical apologetics. I don't know really how it got that name, or maybe it was just kind of the first approach that people took. Um, and, and when I talk about these different approaches, uh, even people who call themselves within these certain groups might define them differently. So the, the definitions that I'm getting from here are from R.C. Sproul's apologetics class. So, you know, I might say something about presuppositional apologetics that, you know, Timothy Keller might say, well, that's not exactly how he would describe it. So just putting that disclaimer out there. Um, so classical apologetics, the confidence level the first one that I talked about in classical apologetics is that they would say that the evidence and, and logical arguments are conclusive and we can have, I guess, a near 100% confidence in not necessarily the Christian faith as being true, but at least the existence of God. R.C. Sproul, for example, lumps himself into this category. He says... He identifies some of these other categories and very explicitly says, no, I am not those things. I'm a classicist. Other people accuse me of being an evidentialist or a presuppositionalist, but no, I'm a class classicist. Um, so he says that for him, the simple philosophical arguments for the existence of God are conclusive and he can have basically certainty. <clears throat> he, he doesn't need to just have um, evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. He says, no, it's 100% conclusive. Um, and for the starting point in classical apologetics, um, the starting point would be the starting point of the ultimate skeptic. So at the very top of the board, um, where we're going to start in this class, um, starting with um, you know somebody who says, my, maybe even says, I don't even know if I exist. He says, let's meet them where they're at, at the ultimate skeptic point um, in there. So I already mentioned R.C. Sproul. He's a notable proponent of classical apologetics. And then William Lane Craig, the other guy I mentioned, he would consider himself a classical apologetic apologist as well. Um, the other second category is presuppositional apologetics. Hopefully I spelled that right. Um, I might be missing an S in there or something. Um, there we go. Um, so presuppositional apologetics is probably one of the more <coughs> controversial approaches and and common, um, one of the ones we hear about most often in kind of reform circles. So the approach to presuppositional apologetics basically says that we have to presuppose the conclusion that God exists because for logic and reason um, to even exist, we have to presuppose a God. Uh, there is no basis for right and wrong, good and evil, logic and reason in the naturalistic worldview without the basis coming from a trans transcendent reality, uh, namely God. So they would say that you have to presuppose those things in order for any of this to even make sense. So therefore, that should be your starting point, and that you don't necessarily need to argue for the existence of God a whole lot, because they might also say that's the approach the Bible takes, um, that... You know, Proverbs says that um, God has put eternity into man's heart, and therefore everybody knows deep down that God exists, and we shouldn't necessarily spend too much time on that, but go straight to proving the Christian faith. Um, and like I said, people who call themselves presuppositional apologists might explain that a little differently, but um, that's kind of the approach. So I, I can kind of articulate that a little better. So for example, um, they might say that in the naturalist worldview, there is no such thing as reason. Um, because if the Big Bang just happened um, with no outside cause, and everything that has proceeded since then is just the result of chemical reactions that kind of were predetermined as how everything was spread about, then even to us today, what's going on in our brains is just simply the result of more and more chemical reactions. They just happen, happen to be where they were, and so 
I'm not even thinking right now. I'm just kind of logically going with the predetermined course of history. And, you know, me and you guys are not reasoning. We're just simply molecules in motion that are just happening. Um, so a presuppositionalist might point to that and say, you have to have a God in order for even our conversation to even make sense, um, in order for us to be reasoning at all. Um, so the confidence level in presuppositional apologetics, I would say, doesn't necessarily address that, but might likely agree with the classical approach that you can have um, near 100% confidence, um, kind of because of what I, what I just explained, in order for anything to make sense, God has to exist. Um, and then the starting point for presuppositional apologetics is kind of what sets it apart, is that they might say, no, you don't have to argue for the existence of God a whole lot, but start there and then move on. Um, and with saying that, um, oh, and so some notable proponents of that are, I would say, Tim Keller, um, John MacArthur. Um, yet, um, there might not be a whole lot of difference between them when the rubber meets the road. So, for instance, somebody like Tim Keller, who would call himself a presuppositionalist, in his book, The Reason for God, you know, he still does spend quite a bit of time arguing for the existence of God. And somebody like R.C. Sproul, who says, no, I'm a classicist, considers the presuppositional argument as another argument in his bag. So they're, even though they might um, kind of be controversial and people might argue about what is the right approach, oftentimes there's not really that much of a difference between them um, at all. Um, the third category is the evidentialist approach. Um, and so the evidentialist approach, um, what sets that apart is the confidence level. Um, somebody who takes that approach to apologetics would say, based off of things like historical evidence, um, we can have a high degree of confidence in Christianity versus other options, um, but there's no reason whatsoever to prove it with 100% confidence or even 99, 95. They just say, we can have more confidence in this. This is more likely than other options. Therefore, we have reason to have faith in it. Um, and the starting point for evidential apologetics, um, similarly to presuppositional, um, doesn't necessarily um, address the starting point, similar to how presuppositional didn't address the confidence level. Um, but most likely, they would have agree with the classical approach, starting with the point of the ultimate skeptic. Um, and a notable proponent of evidentialist apologetics would be Frank Turk, one of the guys that I mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, so within these three approaches, usually the clash is what I, what I talked about, the clash between classical and presuppositional <coughs> apologetics um, in terms of their starting point. Um, but these three groups are not mutually exclusive. Um, somewhat similar to like your view on the end times, you might say, oh, I'm, I'm a classical apologist in terms of uh, my confidence level, but I'm presuppositional in terms of my starting point. You know, like you can kind of mix and match. Um, these aren't super rigidly defined. Um, so I want to pose a question to you guys. Um, one of the things we talked about was our confidence level. But where do you guys fall? Um, anybody can chime in in terms of your belief on what level of confidence you can have or should have to believe or to, have to warrant your faith. Do you believe that we can or should have 100% confidence or simply beyond a reasonable doubt or simply you know, more likely than, than not, 51 versus 49%? I guess what are your guys' thoughts on that? Of what can we have in confidence level or what should we have in order to warrant our faith? Yeah. I think once the Holy Spirit dwells me, I have a percent confidence, but I don't feel like I have to prove, prove it to somebody else. Okay. I don't know where that comes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, so you can personally, because of the testimony of the Holy Spirit, you can be totally sure, um, you know, basically 100%, but when you're proving it, then you don't need to explain it to 100% confidence. Right, because I don't really care. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We all have an opinion on that. Right. So, I 
ideally we'd like to have 100 percent confidence, but obviously everybody doubts things. Yeah. I have a question on what that means because when you're saying 100 percent confidence, are you like um, talking about <coughs> natural <coughs> evidence making you 100 percent confident? Is that is that what that's? Um, I guess I need a little clarification. So, like whether or not we're accounting for like testimony of the Holy Spirit. Right. Our, okay. Um, I guess maybe, yeah, I guess maybe um, simply referring to the, the logical arguments and in terms of deductive reasoning in our own minds. So, so, like, you're trying to get somebody else who's not a believer to have 100% confidence so they can be a believer? Is that, what it, is that the purpose? Uh, I mean, yeah, that's what somebody okay. would say who okay. would hold that view. Um, I have a when you first posed the question, uh, a word came to my mind that uh, we, we read often. Well, maybe not often is a good word, but we do read in the Bible mystery. And, um, but um, just reacting to your question of um, should we have 100% confidence? Can we? Um, I mean, at, at some level of thought and belief, yes, but at another level, um, it is a mystery. That's what faith is. Faith is um, having hope on what you don't see, right? So, yeah, it's, it's a difficult concept, actually, to think about. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes you might have a couple of forms of faith. Uh, one, I would be 100% confidence, and then one, not so much. 100% confidence, and then we're putting our 100% confidence in Jesus from coming from the test of the Holy Spirit and what we've seen, what we've heard, what we've chosen to believe. And then we can know that we have our full confidence there, that we can put all of our chips there. Mm -hmm. But then on our end, you know, we have those doubts coming, coming in and out. We can't say it. We're always thinking, like, yeah, I'm 100% certain of all these things, and I don't have these thoughts that come in. And Mm -hmm. Say, by God's grace, I put, I've leaned my whole life in, in here, and there's no turning back. I, I have put my confidence here, but then all my 100% in me is well, all my, on my end. Yeah, no, I have doubts that come in, I waver in things, but then I put my confidence here. Yeah, no, I appreciate that distinction. That's, yeah, that's helpful. Um, so, mainly, I just want to get you guys thinking about the fact that when discussing the truth of Christianity um, with a non-believer. We don't have to feel pressure that we have to prove the Christian faith infinitely to the 100% degree that we've covered every single nook and cranny in the universe and have proved it to be true. You know, that's, it's impossible to prove anything with infinite knowledge. You can't, you can't have infinite knowledge on any topic. Um, so many might object that we can't have confidence that the Bible is true unless we've read every single word of every single holy book of every religion ever. Um, I would say, no. A, that's pretty much impossible. Um, and if we applied that standard to anything else in life, we wouldn't believe anything. If we can't have infinite knowledge on any topic. Um, so, so regardless of where you fall, of um, you know, we only need 51% confidence in order to at least just have faith and have it be reasonable, or whether or not <clears throat> you kind of hold to a beyond a reasonable doubt level, um, I just wanted to get you thinking about that concept, that there is no such thing as infinite knowledge in any topic, and don't feel pressure to prove that. It's okay to say that you don't know something on a given topic. Um, and so the last approach is for uh, is the fittiest approach, which yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, I would just say, I mean, one way I think maybe in my own heart, a tipping point, I mean, that you never won, mm -hmm. you start out questioning it's wrong, you know, and maybe there can't be a God because of this, or it can't be true because of this, or, you know, like there are questions that come up, and at some point, say in my experience, God did the work, you encounter another complication that instead of pursuing this obviously means God doesn't exist, you're now pursuing. How does this make sense in light of who God is? Which is almost like you then took the presupposition, you're like, 
Okay, well, God has done a work in my heart. I know there is God. There is an explanation. So whether it's a problem of evil or whatever you're, you're deciding, now your pursuit is how do we understand this in the light of who God is instead of kind of questioning it. So wherever the tipping point is and wherever you're talking to or your own heart, that's kind of where you're beginning to explore things from the context of who God is rather than all these are you know, approaching from Um, so the fideist approach is just, that's just Latin for faithist. Um, <clears throat> so kind of in that definition of, of what it is, the person who holds to the fideist approach is kind of, it's kind of a non-apologetic approach. They, they would ultimately say that faith is independent of reason, um, which I would not say. <laughs> um, that they would say reasoning God's existence is completely not necessary, and the compelling case to have faith versus not is all that is needed. So you don't need to prove that God exists, you just need to prove that having faith in him is a good idea, basically, <clears throat> regardless of whether or not he's even real. Um, so the confidence level for Phidias apologetics is kind of it doesn't matter, and the starting point doesn't really matter either, um, because we're not interested in, in reasoning God's existence or reasoning the truth, it's just presenting a compelling case that it's a better idea to believe it versus not. And so the main example of that is something called Pascal's Wager. Some of you guys may have heard of that before. Um, Pascal's Wager is kind of controversial in terms of how much people like it or don't like it. Um, so Blaise Pascal was a 17th century mathematician and physicist who basically just laid down using probability and statistics and thinking of the existence of God as a wager or a bet, like a gamble. Um, and simply just uses that to say you should believe in God based off of this. So his argument, um, I'll read it out, is he says, God is or God is not. Reason cannot decide, decide between the two alternatives. What he says. A game is being played where heads or tails will turn up. He says you must wager. It's not optional. So he basically... God exists or God is not, does not exist, you have to wager on it. There's, you can't not choose. If you don't choose, you're choosing that God doesn't exist. Um, he says, let us weigh the gain and the loss in wagering that God is. Let us estimate these two chances. If you gain, you gain all. If you lose, you lose nothing. So he says, wager then without hesitation that he is. There is here an infinite, an infinity of an infinitely happy life to gain, a chance of gain against a finite number of chances of loss. And what you stake is finite. And so our proposition is of infinite force when there is the finite to stake in a game where there are equal risks of gain and of loss and the infinite to gain. That was a lot of infinites and gains and stuff. But um, basically, basically, he said... From the standpoint of gambling or probability and statistics, being an atheist is just bad math. That's that's what he's saying, and, and ultimately, I, I actually I agree with that. Um, but uh, there are some assumptions in this um, that I would say ultimately don't line up um, biblically in terms of somewhat treating believing that God exists as being equivalent with you know. Jesus Christ being your Lord um, and being born again and um, you know your heart being changed. Just believing that God exists does not equal being a Christian, um, which is kind of what this argument somewhat um, implies, that simply if you're just betting that God exists um, because you want to go to heaven, that, that doesn't make you a Christian. That doesn't, you know, that does not... Um, equal accepting God's gift of Jesus taking your taking your sins upon himself. Um, I don't know. I guess, do you guys have any reactions to that? Of Do you feel like that's a valid argument to even use at all, or should we kind of just not bring that up because it doesn't necessarily line up biblically with where our heart should be? Yeah. It seems like there, there's a spectrum. You can take that approach of all faith, no reason, and say, well, it's not Paul is defending his faith and confirming the gospel, but his prayer was that their love would increase, their faith, their love would increase, so that their knowledge and wisdom would increase, so that they could discern. 
what was right and wrong. So that where does that fall in all of this, that that faith is required, that love is required, so that you can increase the knowledge and wisdom, um, that Holy Spirit playing a part um, seems like you don't want it to be defenseless, the, but the root is the love. No. I don't think we should, we should use it. I think the argument itself has problems that can be pointed out. And even if it didn't have problems, what you point out about it really not lining up biblically, about how it represents your faith, about how it kind of shows people how you treat God or think of God, it's just fraught with all sorts of difficulties that might, yeah, it might lead them to believe things that you don't want them to believe. Yeah. I think, uh, I think this uh, argument you might say it would not be very common maybe at this room, but at the same time, I think that this might be an extremely common uh, practice in the world today. And not, not many people are thinking that deep into it, to, that they're that they're coming from the people's standpoint or something like that. But if I just think of like just across the world or specifically in America, a lot of people who I can even think of, you know, just a lot of people wanting to say, just in case, you know, I, yeah, I believe there's a God. Mm -hmm. You know, like not really. They're putting their chips in all whether, the whether, baskets. Whether, whether or not they're even going to church and then. So, um, not that that's the biggest thing, but you know, um, a lot of people who, depending on who you, uh, who they talk to, might say, "Yeah, I think there's gonna be a God." You know, just in case. You know, I'm not completely sure. You know, like uh, I try to be good just in case because at the end, you know, like uh, if there is, you know, I'd rather be whatever. But then, like, it's just kind of putting like a few chips over there, but then not putting their life in there, just kind of, like, just in case. You know, set aside here for that. It's a very similar point um, that uh, regardless of whether we think uh, somebody should use this or not, a lot of people do. Um, I've heard Christians um, use this in apologetics um, just casually. You know, well, isn't it better to be safe than sorry? Um, which is which is that point? You know. Maybe there's a God, maybe there's not. If there's not, it doesn't really matter. You may as well believe as not believe. Uh, but if there is a God, oh man, you, you better believe. Uh, so doesn't it just make sense to be safe than sorry? Um, and that's a relatively common Christian argument uh, to non-Christians. Um, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of problems with that, as you all are saying. Yeah. But it's very common. And not choosing the creator or, or the savior of Jesus or who he is. But at the same time, what Lindsay was bringing up, um, I'm not sure if this is the fideist argument or not, um, but the idea that you can't really know unless you believe. Um, as people have often called it uh, faith-seeking understanding. It's a long-standing uh, idea in Christian uh, philosophy that um, it's uh, it's all about wearing glasses. How you, I mean, so this is getting into the presuppositional idea that the glasses you're already wearing when you look at things, this is your presupposition, it determines what you believe. You can argue until you're blue in the face with somebody, but uh, but often it actually takes an initial trust for things to all of a sudden, the light bulb to go off, and then the arguments actually make sense. Um, and so some people will point out, um, it's kind of pointless, isn't it, to argue with somebody who doesn't believe, because it takes that light bulb of faith to actually have the arguments make any sense. Or you have the theologians out there who know everything and don't believe at all. The other thing that I would add along those lines, very interesting that I learned. I was having a candid religious conversation with a friend, and he uh, very sort of openly asked me if the world made sense to me. 
and he told me just outright that it doesn't make sense to him. And it was the first time that I sort of learned that it would be potentially off-putting for me to approach apologetics, even if I did feel like I had all the answers and I was 100% confident, that that would actually be off-putting to him because it does not sympathize with the ways in which he struggled. Yeah, and so it was a really interesting moment. Yeah, and that's one of many examples of the truth of how we approach the debate as a Christian differently than you might initially think that there is heart behind what you're saying and your reasoning, and you're treating the person as not just a brain. You're treating the person as a person that has a will and a heart. Um, yeah, so both of you guys perfectly transitioned us into talking about worldview, um, and talking about glasses, and making sense of the world. So, in order to get done on time, I'll speed up a little bit. But So I wanted to um, now talk about kind of do a, do a brief kind of synopsis of like, what is a worldview, what are the implications, and then kind of chart out and outline different worldviews and analyze how different um, systems of thought view the world. Um, so different apologists or different philosophers might kind of put the worldview and what sort of answers the questions into slightly different categories. Um, I'm going to approach it from the terms of Similarly to how you explain the facets of a story or a book you're reading, the who, what, when, where, why, how, um, we'll look at the who, what, when, where, why, how of life or of me. Um, so basically, I would say a worldview answers those questions. It answers the who, what, when, where, why of your life. Um, and depending on how you answer those is what defines what your worldview is. Um, so I'll kind of, so I would say the what is our life. Um, knock that one out first. And the when is ultimately, kind of, I guess, right now or our whole lives, always. Um, so that leaves, I'll pull that up here, kind of an order. Where, who, why, how, and I'm actually going to put another where and cheat a little bit. Um, so I guess you guys want to kind of throw out there. What are kind of the cliche biggest questions in life that you think a worldview should answer? What are the big questions that would start from where or something? Who would know why? Start with those. Where am I going? Where is the world going? Yeah. Where yeah. yeah. Where are we going? So that answers a question of, we'll call it destiny. Where, where am I going? Where did we come from? Yeah. That would be the question of origin. Why do I exist? Yes. Why, why do I exist? Why am I here? And why is there pain and suffering? Yeah. <laughs> I would agree that that's a good question. Um, that's kind of maybe within within the, the how or the why. But, um, origin, meaning, destiny. Couple other ones that I would say are big questions. Who am I? Who am I? So that's a question of identity. And then the last one is the how. How should we live? Yeah. How do I get to the where? Yeah, how should the where? How should I get to the where? How should I live? Um, how should I do this life? So that would be morality of what should I do, what am I supposed to do. Uh, so I would say a worldview answers these questions. Um, some people might categorize them a little differently and say that kind of the meaning, the why, kind of fits within the who, you know, the who you know, leads to the why, but um, that's kind of how I'm categorizing them. So what we believe about these facts affects how we interpret everything in life, kind of whether or not we realize it or not. Um, every single fact that we hear or thing that we see, we unconsciously send it through the filter of our worldview to see whether or not it makes sense. Um, so Jonathan was talking about um, putting on a pair of glasses, so a worldview is commonly compared to that. Of, you know, if somebody has um, pink colored glasses and another person has yellow colored glasses, they see the world a little bit differently. 
how they see the things around them, gets through, put through the filter of those glasses, um, and it will vary. The two people will see the world differently. Um, yeah, anybody have any questions on the big questions? Before we move on? I would say, once we've established what a worldview is, an important question is, how do we determine what a good worldview is? How do we actually evaluate a worldview? Um, a lot of people might say that a worldview is kind of similar to like a culture, where one person's worldview and another person's worldview, one person isn't necessarily right and the other is wrong, they're just different. You know, like a culture is different. One culture cooks this way, another culture cooks this way, and worldview is the same. Some people might say that, that you know, an atheist worldview and a Christian worldview and a Muslim worldview, they're just different worldviews. Nobody's actually right or wrong, it's just how you view the world. Um, I would, I would disagree with that. I would take issue with that. I would say there are um, some tests that we should apply to our own worldview um, and others. And those tests of what they are is, I would say, uh, it should be factual. If the things that you believe in your worldview are false, then I would say that's a false worldview. Um, so are the things you believe actually true? And then similarly to that, is your worldview logically consistent? You know, you might believe a lot of things from different categories of life that appear to be true, but then when you put it all together, does one thing blatantly contradict another thing? Or does, does it, is it cohesive? Does it line up? Um, so it has to be consistent internally as well as be consistent with the outside facts. Um, and then the last one, which to me would not seem immediately obvious, um, but I think is true, um, is that it should be experientially relevant. And I guess what I mean by that is, does the worldview actually have implications on how we live right now. If not, then it's pointless. If, I guess another way to kind of say that is um, if <clears throat> what we believe, if there's no difference in whether or not we believe it, then why should we believe it? Um, yeah, so basically, if it is true, and it doesn't matter whether or not it's true, then why should we believe it if, as true? If it doesn't matter whether it's true. Kind of, um, hopefully that'll make sense as we kind of talk a little bit more about it. But, so those would say, those would be kind of the three tests that I would apply um, <coughs> to a worldview. Does anybody take issue with any of those? I don't take issue with any of those. Yeah. I would, one I would add would be like authoritative, like where's the authority come from, like higher than ourselves. Any human person, you know, that's, we could we could look at you know in our finite minds, okay, factual, logically consistent, relevant to me, but a lot of people you know, you know, we could get our brains to believe some of those things, but then our point is people to like, well, yeah, these are all true for a Christian, but some other people might convince themselves of something else in their mind, but then they don't have a higher authority saying it. Then I'm just going to say the, the factual um, could have problems because what's fact? Somebody can right. Them. Yeah, you point out something really good, is that what your worldview helps you determine what is a valid fact and what is not a valid fact. That's <laughs> yes. Oh, 
just going to say, I think the logically consistent one is maybe the most important one, at least as I see it right now, because it's the one that, um, if, at least in my mind, somebody who's holding a false worldview, it's the one that I think is the hardest to detect. Um, because it's this sort of, as long as you're viewing all these true facts that are experientially relevant in sort of isolation, it's just hard to pull things together or to identify the ways in which, actually I have these thoughts that are kind of incoherent. I think this one thing over here this way, but actually if I carry that out to this other topic over here, that doesn't really work. So it's the one that's really hardest to see if it is logically inconsistent. Yeah. So um, I'm going to breeze on quick to help to us looking through some of the different um, worldviews in order to um, get done on time. But so uh, these questions of worldview and the tests applied to them. Um, so Robbie Zacharias, one of my favorite apologists, when posed with the question of how do you know that Christianity is the you know the one true religion versus others, he would he would kind of point to the topic of worldview and basically say that he believes that the Christian worldview answers those questions the best and does so in a way that is most factual, most logically consistent, and most spiritually relevant and that relevant. And that to him is kind of the really brief version of why he would say that that's how he can know that the Christian worldview is the correct one or why the Christian religion is the one true religion. That's like the super quick answer that he might give. Um, and a quote from C.S. Lewis that I absolutely love, that some of you have heard before, um, in regards to the topic of worldview, he says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. Um, so I think that's kind of touching on that topic of worldview, that he not only sees the truth of Jesus, but that truth of Jesus explains everything else around him perfectly in a way that's logically consistent. Everything makes sense in light of that. Um, yeah, and I think that's powerful. So, I want to that uh, uh, those questions, where did I come from? Who am I? Why am I here? How should we live? And where are we going? I want to answer those from <clears throat> kind of some big categories of, of worldview. So I'm going to do atheism, agnosticism. I'll throw in kind of Buddhism or kind of in general Eastern religions and then contrast that with the Christian worldview. We could throw in a lot more worldviews and analyze more, but I would kind of think of those as kind of some of the big ones in our world right now. Um, so, in the atheist worldview, where do they say that we came from? Or how would they answer that question? Big Bang. Big Bang, okay. Evolution. Okay, so, kind of, like, the Earth, or nowhere. In, they might pose that either way. Say <laughs> um, So, I'll just kind of say nowhere in terms of from the supernatural, but they might just say, like, from the Earth, molecules that you're made of. Um, who are we? Based off of that, they would say, you know, we are a collection of molecules. That's that's what we are. Um, and although when talking to an atheist, they might not give that answer, I'm kind of, um, from my own perspective, getting to the heart of what I think is the, the implication, like, necessarily of what they would say. Um, so, I might say, you know, we came from nowhere. What we are ultimately is a collection of molecules. We are stardust. Maybe you've heard that phrase before. Um, or we are simply smart animals um, in comparison to the other creatures that exist. So why are we here? Um, atheists might answer that question very differently. Some might very bluntly say there is no reason that we are here. There, there is no why. That's a, they would say that's an invalid question, there is no reason that we're here, or others I have heard say is the reason we are here or the purpose we are here is to create our own purpose. 
Um, so they might answer that a couple different ways to create our own purpose or for no reason. So how should we live? Similarly, they might answer that question who you're talking to. Um, but I would say almost all of them would still hold to the fact that as an atheist, they still believe that they should live and should live rightly. Um, how they determine what that morality is, they would differ on. Um, but they might define it as what is best for other conscious beings. That's how Sam Harris, um, an atheist who wrote a book not that long ago, trying to argue that as an atheist, he can have objective morality. Um, and that was his kind of definition of morality. What is best for the flourishing of other conscious beings? That's how you define that. And where are we going? <clears throat> Similarly, back to the earth or nowhere. Um, yeah, so because this is a class taking place in a church, uh, we don't have the luxury of having people from all these categories to cross-reference and, and fact-check, so obviously there's kind of a little bit of, um, it may seem unfair. Um, but yeah, I would say those things are necessarily true from the atheist worldview. Um, so the agnostic worldview, um, I'm going to kind of say that's the I don't know. Um, ultimately, the, the quick answer to the agnostic worldview is, well, that's kind of the point, is there you, there's no, I don't know, how do I, for any of those questions, I don't see enough evidence to believe anything specifically of regarding God's existence or whatever, and since that is what informs all the rest of them, the answer is kind of, I don't know. Either IDK or I don't know, or IDC, I don't care. Yes, <laughs> both, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> They don't have a reason to care enough, or they don't have enough evidence to believe. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll kind of call this the Buddhist worldview slash Eastern religion worldview, and this won't capture it perfectly, you know, depending if you're talking to a Buddhist or a Hindu, um, they'll answer these questions a little differently. For instance, they'll have different views on what reincarnation is, etc. Um, but where did we come from? And I say a past life. And who are we? Um, in kind of a, an overarching theme of uh, being, I guess, kind of one with the universe, or they are the universe, or uh, perhaps you might hear a new agey Eastern religion person say, uh, they are God because God is everything, God is the universe. They might say it that way. Um, as an example, um, Jim Carrey, an actor that I really like, who I think is hilarious, is very into Eastern religions now. And he, in a, in a speech that I heard one time, he was talking about people love the Super Bowl. And he's like, I am the Super Bowl. That's way better. Because he thinks he is one with the universe and one with everything. Therefore, he is the Super Bowl. That was his you know, train of thought. Uh, so how should they live? Or sorry, I skipped why. Why are they here? That's the reason they're here is to be one with the universe, is, is what some might phrase it as. Like I said, depending on who you're talking to, they might explain it very differently, but that's kind of an overarching idea. Um, how should they do it? Uh, Buddhists specifically would say they do it by getting rid of desires and ignorance. Um, and where are they going? To another life. And then lastly, the Christian worldview, since we're like running out of time a little bit, um, I guess help me answer these questions, guys, of, of what what is the Christian way that we answer all these questions? Where are we coming from? Or where do we come from? God created. Yeah. God created us. Who are we? Yeah, we are. We are image bearers. Exactly, we are made in the image of God. God will tend to be a central theme answering these questions. In the Christian uh, so why are we here? To glorify God. Yeah, to glorify God. And enjoy Him forever. Agreed. 
how should we do that, or how should we live? I'll take an easy way to, the best way to articulate that for me, especially in keeping with the theme, is um, in accord with God's character. Or that's how I would define what morally is. Um, and then where are we going? Presence. Yeah, into his presence or not. It's kind of the, yep. I'm just thinking in terms of the Muslim worldview, um, what do you do to justify the tribing that? Would be, yeah, that would be a distinction because a lot of these things um, between the monotheistic religions would look quite similar, and a distinction between Christianity and, say, Islam would be um, who that God is. Yeah. So I want to quick point out um, using the tests that we came up with, um, kind of look at these very briefly. Uh, so, in the atheist worldview, one of the um, things I pointed out as a test would be that it's logically consistent. I would say that one thing that I could point to through the atheist worldview being logically inconsistent would be the how we're living versus who we are. And we'll get into that in the moral argument when we do that class, but if we are in fact a collection of molecules and we are just stardust, then why we should live morally, I think that's a contradiction. I don't think there is any reason to do this if this is true. So those, I think, butt heads in the atheist worldview big time. Um, there, there's no... There's no impetus to do the how based off of the who. Um, the next one, the agnostic worldview. Uh, so I would say the agnostic worldview is internally coherent. It is logically consistent, I mean, in a very simple way, but it is not experientially relevant, that last one. Um, if agnosticism is true, it doesn't matter whether or not it's true, and therefore we should not believe it. Um, that would be kind of my slick way to say that. But uh, the third one, in the, in the Buddhist worldview, one thing that I would point to, similarly to being um, logically consistent, um, so the how of life is that we're supposed to live life getting rid of our desires. That's what one of the big things Buddha harped on. That was one of the big points that we're suffering because we have those these desires and we must get rid of all of our desires. So that is the how, yet um, the, the who of who we are and why we're, we're supposed to live in order to be one with the universe. I would say that is a desire. They're desiring to be one with the universe and they're doing that by suppressing all desires. That's, I mean, that might seem like a kind of a cheap shot, or like a really simple um, thing that maybe I'm not diving into deep enough. I would say that's that's a logical inconsistency. There's um, also the desire for a better second life. Yeah, for another life. Exactly. So yeah. To do, have a better life. Yeah. And that's a desire for a better. Yeah, life. And, it's, and as soon as you do anything in life, it's impossible to escape that. that you're desiring to do something, and you're trying to express the desires. How does that make sense? Um, Ravi Zacharias, when pointing this out to a Buddhist priest from Thailand. Um, and a, and a kind of a funny story he tells is that basically pointed out that that contradiction that you're trying you're desiring these things and doing them by getting rid of desires and the Buddhist response was uh, quote we try not to get into these philosophical questions like it was just just like an admission that like you might be right but I'm going to overlook it um, so then the last one Christian worldview I would say like the C.S. Lewis quote kind of gets at. Um, answers these questions in what I believe is the most factual way, in the most logically consistent way, and in the way that matters. It actually makes a difference as to how we're supposed to live right now. Um, yeah. Another thing I was going to quick cover was um, I, did, I, I listened to multiple TED Talks on the concept of worldview, which is kind of like my my way of accessing what does the world of secular people who consider themselves intelligent believe about worldview. Um, and basically their synopsis was um, 
the study of worldview. So I listened to a couple of different ones, um, a guy by Archer Nielsen and a guy, another guy named Todd Weir. The psychology of worldview and what's in a worldview. Both of them basically said worldview is something that comes from evolution because we are evolved beings. Um, we we grasp for meaning in the world, and because we need meaning in the world, we come up with a worldview. So their study of worldview comes from their belief in evolution. So they put their belief in evolution not even within their own worldview, because worldview comes from evolution, if that makes sense. Um, and basically, both of them lumped two different worldviews as existing, basically. The humanist, or atheist, or naturalist worldview, and then the religious, or what they call the normativist worldview. And I just kind of wanted to do this one quick as kind of a sobering thought to, to, to get across what we're overcoming as Christians as to how the world views our worldview. I mean, this is how we view our worldview, the last column. But how the world views our worldview. Um, like the, the Archer Nielsen guy, he had a table of basically his own kind of version of this. He said, in, in regards with human nature, he said the humanist worldview believes that people are good. The religious worldview believes that people are bad, inherent. And I would say the Christian, you know, Christian theology agrees with that we're inherently sinful. The next category was how we handle interpersonal relationships. He said, in the humanist worldview, there is unconditional love. And in the religious worldview, there is contingent respect. And I guess that should kind of like strike us as being, that should, that should like, I don't know, hit us in the heart. But that's how he views us. He says, in my, my humanist worldview, I can have unconditional love, but you religious people just have contingent, contingent respect. Um, how do we handle feelings? He, he said, the humanist worldview handles feelings with openness. And in the religious worldview, they handle feelings with control. And we want to control other people and their feelings. But in the humanist worldview, you are able to be open, since we're all on the same playing field in his mind. How do we handle knowledge? In the humanist worldview, he says, we have room for imagination and exploration. But in the religious worldview, there is only rigor and observation because everything is strictly divine, defined by your God, and you aren't allowed to break the bounds. So you cannot have imagination or explore. But in my humanist worldview, I can. And he said, in regards to society, the humanist worldview, there are rights and there is well-being. That's exactly what he said. In the normanist worldview, normativist or religious worldview, there is only law and order because we're all sinful at heart, so therefore everybody just must be controlled, not encouraged. Um, so we want to kind of put that as kind of a footnote at the end of basically like that's what that's what the world views our worldview as, and that's a huge hurdle to overcome when we're trying to talk to them about worldview and what is a true world worldview, etc. Um, yeah. Cool. Does anybody want to volunteer to close us in prayer? Or as I will. Sure. Oh, Father, thank you for carving out time and space for us to to think with each other and be guided by Ricky. We know that you have the perfect worldview since you designed it all, all of reality. You created it all perfect. You know all things without exception. And we're grateful that you have put your spirit within us as we trust your son. Because spiritual things are not discernible by uh, fleshly humans without your spirit. They are only discernible by your spirit. And so we thank you that you are at work in us and that you will be at work in us and through us when we talk with other image bearers who do not know you and do not have your spirit. Uh, would you help us to uh, be humble in our own understanding and quest to have your worldview as ours? 
which is ultimately one of love and truth and perfection. And we ultimately want this so we can honor your son better. So please help us do that in his name. Amen. Uh, so next week we're going to talk about the laws of logic, uh, which sounds boring, and then addressing uh, postmodernism and pluralism, the idea that truth is relevant, or the idea that you know, all roads lead to the same God. We're going to talk about that stuff.